We're now joined by an expert in the sector. He's Rob Wessel, managing partner at Hamilton ETFs and a former Bay Street Bank analyst. Rob, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, when I asked you before we came to air if there was a, a theme in these results, you said no. Uh, why don't you explain what you've seen in these numbers? Yeah, so there's only two banks I've reported so far. Um, both of them uh, seem to diverge. So some of the things that um, went well for Bank of Nova Scotia or better um, didn't go as well for Bank of Montreal. So Bank of Montreal pretty much missed on everything that mattered um, when you're looking at some of the trends. Um, last quarter I was here and Bank of Nova Scotia reported, you asked me were the results as bad as uh, they looked and I right. said no I didn't think so because this was more of a classic cleanup quarter and I think right. in this quarter here I think you're seeing some of the benefits of what was taken place last quarter. Bank of Montreal was so messy, it almost looked like this was a cleanup quarter. There were so many one-time items. I'll tell the viewers a bit about uh, the Bank of Montreal numbers again. <clears throat> Adjusted profit comes in at $1.9 billion. In Canadian personal and commercial banking, adjusted profit uh, was $925 million. That was down 3%, so profit declines in the core Canadian banking franchise. South of the border, where BMO has a big business, adjusted profit was $635 million. That was down 5% from the uh, prior year. And uh, as we noted in our newscast, uh, in the capital markets segment, uh, profit was $408 million. That was down fully 17% from a year earlier. Why don't you talk to us a bit about uh, the Scotiabank results? Yeah, so Scotiabank was uh, better than expected. And I, th I would say one of the main reasons was credit. In the past, so the banks have been taking about six quarters in a row where they've been building reserves against their performing portfolio. Uh, Bank of Montreal took a big increase in the performing allowance, whereas Bank of Nova Scotia did not, and that's moderating a very significant headwind. And then when you take into account capital markets were okay, uh, and they had some margin expansion. There was just a lot of stuff that was just getting a little incrementally better at Bank of Nova Scotia, and expectations were not that great. And so you've said the theme of these results is that there is no theme thus far. Yeah. Of course, investors, of course, jump on the early sets of bank yeah. results to determine uh, is there a theme for the rest of the quarter. Uh, what kind of themes were you looking for, or did you think might emerge here? Yeah, so I think, you know, in order for bank stocks to get moving, the reserve builds have to moderate. That's very important. It'd be good if they got better market-sensitive revenues. And then obviously if the Canadian economy could get moving. So we were looking for one of the more important things would be would the reserve builds stop? Because they've been going for six quarters. They've been highly material. Uh, and Bank of Nova Scotia, they did uh, on the performing side. And in Bank of Montreal, they took a big increase. So that's why I'm saying, you know, that was a contradictory message. Expenses, we were, you know, wanting to keep an eye on. Both BNS and BMO did okay. Uh, did fine, I would say. It wasn't a problem. On the revenue side, again, it was a bit mixed. Bank of Nova Scotia was better than the market was looking for, and BMO was worse. I think a lot of viewers might be interested in uh, what you, when you've got a short amount of time, like you did this morning, to look at yeah. uh, two sets of bank results. What what lines do you look at first? What, what do you think are the most important items for an ordinary retail investor to look at when he or she gets their hands on an earnings release from a big Canadian bank? Yeah, so when you think about it, these are essentially super tankers. These companies move in a very slow, but you know, um, consistent pace. There's only a couple things that can move earnings quickly. One is capital markets, which here was benign. It was basically flat. And the other is credit. So it's very important to look at credit, in particular, what's happening with impaired loan losses, what's happening with performing, and then also what's happening with gross impaired loans. One thing we didn't talk about is last quarter, there was a very large increase in gross impaired loans, or what we'll call bad loans. Uh, they did creep up again for both banks uh, this quarter. But having said that, all of, that's, all of that aside, it isn't so much that provisions and credit are rising. The question is, are they rising more than consensus? And consensus, the street's looking for about 17 billion of loan losses this year, and they only reported they reported 13 and a half billion last year. So it isn't that credit is going up. Everybody knows it's going up. The question is, is it when you think about how do I buy? Do I buy bank stocks now or do I wait? Are they going up more than the market's expecting? And mm -hmm. I think still the answer to that is still probably no. So I hear you looking at uh, uh, gross impaired loans. Yeah. Do, do I hear you saying that provisions for credit losses is not all that useful, that you need to look more at No, no, I, they both interact. Okay. Um, so if, if gross impaired loans are rising, mm -hmm. chances are provisions are rising. But there's two categories of loan losses, one on the impaired side, one on the performing side. And so if, if gross impaired loans can, can start moderating their increase, then I think you'll find provisions for credit losses will moderate. But again, back to, you know, if the analysts are, are very, very conservative on provisions, they cer certainly seem c conservative, it isn't that they're going up, is are they going to go up more than the market's looking for? And again, that doesn't seem to be the case. 